that was required in the October 2021 law. Town Hall is an outreach on my part to our notary public and those interested. Time is reserved at the end of the town hall for questions, and you may find that your questions are answered throughout the course of the presentation if you hold off on them. You may also place <clears throat> questions in the chat box, but please, in order to prevent confusion about the source of the response, please do not answer any questions placed in the chat box. Let me say that one more time. In order to prevent confusion about the source of the response, please do not answer any questions placed in the chat box. Our SOS staff will announce the questions in the chat box at the end of the town hall, and we will respond at that time. Our notary offices are available at the Office of the Secretary of State to answer your questions and to provide information only, but cannot provide legal advice. For legal advice, an individual should contact the legal counsel who specializes in that area, a particular area of law in which you're interested. So we'll do our very best to answer all the questions that are placed in the chat box and any other questions you may have at the end of the town hall during the Q&A session. As we begin, please mute your microphone. You may keep your cameras on if you'd like. Without further ado, allow me to introduce our division administrator, Michael Schlein. Mike? Thanks, Kathy. Good morning, everybody. Kathy, you hear me good? We can hear you fine. Yeah, all right, good deal. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, I can hear you. Yep. We hear you. All right. I guess, thank you, everybody. Uh, so notary public, uh, allowable actions a notary may perform. Uh, so before we get started here and into the details, uh, different sources of uh, legal authority regarding notaries public, uh, the Maryland Constitution, uh, the Annotated Code of Maryland, uh, Title 18, uh, Subtitles 1 and 2. Uh, that's where the, the laws regarding notaries are found in the Code of Maryland Regulations. Uh, 010208 01 through 12, um, what we're covering here. And uh, that's where you can find the regulations uh, in Maryland, the Code of Maryland regulations. And also, uh, there's this link here at the bottom to look up the law and to look up the regulations as well. You can search the law on that first link, and you can search regulations in Maryland at that second link. Uh, so if anybody's ever curious to look up a law, whether it's related to notaries or anything else, uh, those are the places you could uh, you could do that. So let's begin. Uh, types of notarizations, general powers, identifying signers and authority. Um, so go over a different couple scenarios here when notarizing. Um, and the first one here is the most common one, the in-person notarization. This is the notarization that's been around for Forever and ever, um, we're in person, we're face to face, we're in the same room at the same time. Uh, that's what we mean to be in person, right? Not in two different places at the same time, together, looking at each other uh, at the same point in time. And, and a notary may perform any material act uh, or that they're allowed to do in the law. We're gonna cover the different types of notarial acts a little later on in the, uh, in the presentation. Uh, but these material acts uh, happen in person in the traditional manner that I think most everybody is familiar with. And every time you're in person, um, you're going to do certain things. No matter what type of material act it is, you're going to do certain things. You're always going to be in the same physical presence of the person requesting the material act. You're going to always identify the signer uh, using a valid government photo issued ID. Uh, you may, if you have personal knowledge of the signer, you could identify somebody through personal knowledge, meaning you know them, um, and, or, or, or a credible third-party witness. But the, the best form of identification is always valid government photo, issue, uh, photo ID. Uh, witness the signing of the document, or in certain situations, somebody can attest to the fact that they've already signed it. And uh, fix or seal and execute the notarization. In other words, that notarial certificate 
and you're going to make an entry in your register of official acts. There are other steps depending on the type of notarization that you may do, but these are really the same every time, no matter what. You're going to do these certain things, and you're going to see this reiterated here later on as we go through the various types of notarial acts, uh, kind of a step by step of what to do. And um, you're going to see these five themes uh, repeated uh, throughout each of those types of notarial acts. So, always in the same place, same physical presence as the, the person requesting the act, always identifying the signer, always witnessing the signature or getting an attestation to the fact that they signed, always affixing your seal, completing the notarial certificate, and always making an entry in your notary journal. Uh, there are some times where a notary may travel uh, to do an in-person notarization, and that's that's perfectly fine. And a notary is allowed to charge certain fees to travel to perform those notarizations. Again, we're talking just specifically notarizations. Uh, a lot of folks will start asking questions about being a title insurance producer. This is not anything about being a title insurance producer. Uh, so notaries can travel to perform notarizations. Uh, oftentimes, people refer to them as a mobile notary. Uh, it's not a separate licensing category in notary public. It's not anything you're going to find written uh, in the notary law about being a mobile notary. It's just, just a term people use to describe themselves to indicate that they are willing to travel for notarial acts. And the notary public uh, may, if they travel, uh, charge $5, uh, a base fee of $5 to travel, plus the IRS. Uh, business travel mileage rate um, and that's set that travel rate is set by the internal revenue service by the irs so five dollars plus mileage plus the fees that you can charge for any notarial act so four dollars per notarial act um, the irs mileage rate we we try to update that on our website there at that link on the notary page uh, but uh, if you're ever curious if it if it were to change or update if you just do a Google search of uh, internal revenue service mileage rate for business travel. Uh, you know, you'll get a search result that takes you to the IRS uh, posting about the current business travel rate. Mike, it might be worth noting at this point that the fees you're referring to are exclusively referencing business travel only. Mm -hmm. They're not the fees that can be um, charged for a notarial act, which currently are $4 for notarial act. Um, so just Correct. to make that, that matter clear. Correct. Yeah, if we were in a situation uh, where we were traveling to do a notarization, I can charge $5 because I'm traveling. I can charge, in addition to that, I can charge mileage. And in addition to that, I can charge $4 per notarial act. So it's not a total of five dollars. Folks sometimes get confused about this. Oh, it's only five bucks for only mileage. No, it's five dollars plus mileage plus four dollars for notarial act. Thanks, Mac. And I will also ask one more time for our participants to refrain, please, from adding any response, any uh, answers to any questions in the chat box. Please let our notary officers respond to that. But we will do that in our Q and A session. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, notary uh, may also do something called an electronic notarization, uh, sometimes called electronic, sometimes uh, digital. Uh, but uh, the, what's happening here is a notary is notarizing an electronic document. Uh, they're affixing an electronic or digital seal and signature to perform the notarial act. Electronic notarization, not to be confused with remote notarization, which we're going to talk about next. Electronic notarization still requires the notary to be in the physical presence of the signer and witness the signer affixing their electronic signature to an electronic document. So we're still in person. Uh, we're just in person doing this, usually on a computer or some type of electronic device, uh, sometimes referred to as an e-notary. And again, it's not a, it's not a separate licensing category, uh, but electronic notarization, it's in person. It's just on an electronic record. Uh, rather than the, the the paper document, a hard copy record. Uh, so everything is generally the same, except for that it's an electronic record and signature, an electronic uh, notary seal and notary signature as well. Uh, again, not to be confused with remote notarizations. 
which uh, which we're going to talk about now. So uh, we have remote material acts. Uh, they became allowed under the law effective October 1st, 2020. And with the remote material act, the signer appears before the notary at the time of the notarization um, on an electronic record. So a remote material act on an electronic record, they're using specifically designed and approved audiovisual technology uh, to perform the notarial act. And uh, the specifically designed and approved technology, uh, it, it's, uh, it's called a remote online notary vendor. So the remote online notary vendors, they create technology that allows uh, individuals and notaries to meet up virtually. So we're not in the same room anymore. We're on different ends of a electronic device of a remote online notary vendors platform and technology. And we're looking at each other, seeing and hearing each other, talking to each other through this communication technology that's purpose design, um, watching you sign an electronic record in real time. You're watching me affix my notary seal and complete the notarial certificate on the same electronic record in real time on this technology. So it's replacing and essentially replacing the in-person experience with this virtual meetup, but everything's still happening in real time. Uh, so when you have an electronic record that's being notarized, you need to use a remote online notary vendors technology. And, um, but again, as a, wit as a notary, I'm still seeing you do this and we're all still sharing the same document rather than having a paper document together in person. We have an electronic document together on this platform, on this technology that's allowing us to do this all electronically in real time uh, in that same moment and occurrence. Uh, remote online notary vendors also provide technology to assist in the identification of a person appearing before the notary by using credential analysis and identity proofing. Um, and the remote online notary vendor technology is allowing the notary to comply with the recording requirements of the law as well. So uh, if you have a remote notarial act on electronic record, that remote online notary vendor uh, platform is going to record that transaction where everything's being notarized. It's going to allow you to meet the requirements of that recording and allow you to retain it for 10 years um, through their process uh, that they have. But uh, the key there is you're having a recording, you're recording it for and keeping that recording for 10 years. Credential analysis and identity proofing. Um, you know, everybody's familiar a lot of times if you do anything online these days, knowledge based questions uh, to ensure that it's only the person that that is trying to log in is the person that is logging in. Um, identity proofing, uh, verification of the identification credential through certain technologies to make sure it's a real ID. Uh, in, in addition to showing the ID on that on that technology. So the remote online notary vendors technology allows for all this to be done securely on electronic records. And we have an, uh, a list of authorized remote online notary vendors that you can find on the notary page of our website and select between those to do remote material acts on electronic records. Now there is a uh, uh, something new, remote material acts on tangible records. Uh, some people may remember certain things that were temporarily allowed at the beginning of the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 state of emergency. Um, so this is not exactly the same, but similar. Uh, but now just codified in the law, there's a process that you must follow to do remote notarial acts on tangible records. So you can now perform those remote notarial acts on tangible records effective June 1st of this year. So uh, what, 12 days ago, uh, the law went into effect. So you can notarize a tangible or, or hard copy paper document using a wedding signature. Uh, however, you can only perform a remote notarial act on a tangible record for an individual that you can identify by personal knowledge or a credible witness. So personal knowledge, again, you know the person, you have satisfactory knowledge of them and their identity to be able to satisfactorily identify them and know that they are the person appearing before you. It is the correct person, that is their identity, you know who they are. A credible witness, so in other words, a credible third party witness that could vouch for the identity of the signer um, 
and uh, those processes are explained in more detail in the law. Uh, so remember earlier, I gave you the lookup link uh, where you could uh, look up the law, and um, it, so it covers it in there. But uh, but personal knowledge, credible witness, and if you know how to identify somebody through personal knowledge or credible witness, then then you can do a remote material act on a tangible record. If you don't know the person appearing before you remotely, and you need to look at their ID in order to identify them and satisfactorily identify them, then you cannot do a remote material act on a tangible record. You have to use, if you do not know the person through personal knowledge or credible witness, you have to use a remote online notary vendor uh, because when you have to identify somebody using an identification credential like a driver's license or passport or something, they have to pass through credential analysis and identity proofing, which is done on a remote online notary vendor's uh, technology. And uh, so if we're doing a remote ink uh, type of notarial act on this tangible record, the notary must record the transaction and keep that recording for 10 years. So you're on your own, you have to use technology and you have to remember to record it and you have to keep that recording for 10 years if you're doing a, a remote notarial act on the tangible record. The individual appearing before the notary uh, during the audiovisual recording signs a tangible record and a declaration that is going to be part of or securely attached to the record, then sends that tangible record and declaration to the notary public not later than three days after the notarial act. And after the receipt of that tangible record and declaration, the notary must reasonably confirm that the tangible record received is the same tangible record the individual sign on the audiovisual recording and execute the required certificate. So the notary is going to get this uh, tangible record and declaration, and they're going to look at it and make sure that they can reasonably confirm that that is the same thing that they watch the individual execute on that audiovisual recording. And the, uh, the record is going to stay a tangible record throughout the process of getting it notarized. Um, so what does that mean? <clears throat> if I am signing a, a tangible record before a notary remotely and I send it to them, it has to stay a tangible record the whole time. I can't send it to them by email or by fax because now it's turning into an electronic record. So this is strictly for tangible records, only tangible records, and they need to stay a tangible record through the time the notary. Michael, you're muted. You're muted. We can't hear you. You need to. Um, you can wear. Thank you. I don't know how that happened. Um, <laughs> I guess technology didn't like what I was saying. Um, so, yeah, so it stays a tangible record throughout. And um, so there's going to be a, another town hall entirely about remote material acts later this year. Where we'll talk about remote notarizations in much greater detail, both remote online notary vendor, uh, you know, remote material acts for, for electronic records and uh, this new thing in the law that allows remote material acts on tangible records in certain situations when you can identify them through personal knowledge or credible witness. Far more detail to come on that at that next challenge. So about general powers and duties, what, what does a notary actually do? Uh, well, we take an acknowledgement of a record, uh, verification on oath or affirmation of a statement, witness or attest to a signature, certify or attest a copy of a record or item that was copied in, in someone's possession, certify a tangible copy of electronic record is an accurate copy of that electronic record, make a note, uh make or note a protest of a negotiable instrument in accordance with that uh, commercial law article uh, we're going to talk about all these in detail here later on and go through uh what you're doing for each type of notarial act but this is you know a lot of folks say well you're just witnessing a signature well yeah but you're doing more uh and these are the different things you're going to do as a notary these are your powers as a notary public if you're being asked to do something that isn't on this list, you're being asked to do something that the notary isn't empowered to do. So authority of the notary, 
uh, you can perform notarial acts in any county of the state or in the city of Baltimore, regardless of where you are commissioned. So for example, let's say I'm commissioned in Baltimore City. I can notarize anywhere in Maryland. I can notarize in Baltimore City. I can notarize out in Ocean City. I can notarize out in Garrett County, down in St. Mary's, up in Cecil County, anywhere in the state of Maryland, as long as I am physically located in the state of Maryland at the time of the notarial act, I can notarize that record. Even if I'm, you know, regardless of the county I'm commissioned in. And a notary public is not authorized to act as a notary public in another state or the District of Columbia. So if you have a Maryland Notary Commission, it does not automatically qualify you to notarize in another state. Your Maryland Notary Commission only qualifies you to notarize while you're in the state of Maryland. If you want to be able to notarize in another state, you need to become a notary in that state. A notary can also notarize documents coming from or going to anywhere as long as you're in Maryland at the time of the notarial act. So I that's a really good point. I believe there was a question that I, that I saw pop up about that, you know, regarding the parties being in the same state. So the Maryland notary, notary must be physically located in the state of Maryland, not necessarily in the jurisdiction in which they were commissioned, but in the state of Maryland. Right, and that's uh, that's even true for a remote notarial act. Uh, if you are notarizing something uh, using a, uh, if you're doing a remote notarial act for someone, you, the notary, still have to be standing in Maryland. Uh, we can all only authorize Maryland notaries in the state of Maryland. Uh, so the Maryland notary always has to be present in the state at the time of the notarial act, even for a remote notarial act. Uh, now the signer. Uh, on a remote notarial act, it doesn't matter really where the signer is as long as the notary is in Maryland. Uh, but if you're doing an in-person notarization, of course, the signer would also have to be in Maryland because the signer and the notary would have to be in the same location at the same time to conduct that in-person notarial act. Exactly. Uh, so um, you know, we, we have questions folks ask us all the time. Uh, you know, can I, can, I, can I notarize? Can I go to, to Washington, D.C. to notarize something? Well not with your Maryland Notary Commission, not with your Maryland Notary Seal. Your Maryland Notary Seal is valid to use in Maryland. If you wanted to notarize something in DC, you need to be a DC notary and you need to, to apply with DC separately. Um, there's not reciprocity in the sense that just because you're a Maryland notary, you get to be a Maryland a, a notary anywhere else. Um, you would apply with DC and that's, that's an area where the same true in Virginia or Delaware or Pennsylvania or anywhere else. If you're in another state, you need to be a notary in that state. Uh, you can't use your Maryland notary seal there because we're only authorizing it for use in Maryland. Yeah, and so to that point, Mike, really good point. Um, a Maryland notary is authorized to notarize documents in the state of Maryland, they have to physically be in the state of Maryland, but they may also have um, a notary commission in other states or other jurisdictions like the District of Columbia at the very same time that would allow them then to notarize a document if they were in Pennsylvania, if they had the Pennsylvania Notary Commission, they can do that. If they're in the District of Columbia and they have a District of Columbia um, notary, they can do that. But under the auspices of those jurisdictions, not under the Maryland Notary Seal. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, conflicts of interest. A uh, notary may not perform a notarial act with respect to a record to which the notary or the spouse of the notary is a party or in which either the notary or their spouse has a direct beneficial interest. Um, so cannot notarize for yourself, cannot notarize for your spouse. Not allowed, not allowed under the law. Uh, it expressly forbids that. And uh, while the, the law only prevents a notary from performing the act for themselves or their spouse when there's a direct beneficial interest, a notary should really refrain from performing notarial acts in the following two circumstances. Uh, one, for any member of your immediate family, uh, you're not under legal duty to refrain for someone that's a family member uh, that's not your spouse. So you can't obviously notarize for yourself or your spouse. You don't have to refrain for another member of your family, but you should. And um, the notary public, right, you're the you're kind of the official third party witness 
to this transaction, right? You're identifying people, you're a disinterested party. And uh, although not under the legal duty to refrain for other members of your family, you should. Uh, there are many notaries in the state of Maryland, uh, 80,000 plus, and um, you can find another notary uh, to do that. So stay away. Uh, in, a, in a prior life, I, I handle complaints against notaries. And I, I can tell you a good chunk of those complaints were disputes between family members and many of those times with another family member who served as the notary. And, um, you know, we love our families, uh, but sometimes things get messy and things get sticky and things go bad. And it's best to not notarize for any family members and, um, you know, just, just find somebody else that's not related to be the notary. The other scenario, uh, any anything in which the notary is personally involved, even if indirectly, or where there is no beneficial interest, so not under a duty to refrain in the situation, but best if your name comes up in the situation, to not involve yourself as a notary, even if it's an indirect mention of you or there's no beneficial interest to you in this in this record that you're going to be notarizing, just stay out of it. Same thing, right? Just the appearance of the conflict is not a good appearance, even if you're not under the uh, legal duty to refrain from it. So no notarizations for yourself, no notarization for a spouse, uh, but when you can, stay away from notarizing for any immediate family and anytime you're direct, indirectly involved or no beneficial interest. You'll thank me later. Um, other restrictions, a, a commission as a notary public does not authorize a notary to assist the person in drafting legal records or give legal advice. Act as an immigration consultant or expert on immigration matters. Represent a person in judicial or administrative proceedings. And you can't get paid for any of those acts above just for being a notary. So if you're a notary public, you're not authorized to give legal advice. If you're a licensed attorney, that's what you do, right? You give legal advice. So if you're a notary who is an attorney, obviously you can do certain things because you're, you're an attorney. Uh, but somebody that's just a notary public that doesn't have a license to do any of the following things, you cannot say, I'm a notary public, let me help you draft legal records. I'm a notary public, let me be an immigration consultant. That You cannot do those things. And you cannot be compensated for doing those things. If you want to do these uh, these above things, you need to be you have know, the proper licensing or authorization to do those. And a notary public may not engage in false or deceptive advertising. I uh, cannot use the term, term notorio or notorio publico, notorio public, unless the notary is a licensed attorney that can practice law in the state. And uh, you cannot advertise or represent that the notary may assist persons in drafting legal records or giving legal advice unless the notary is an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Maryland. So again, <clears throat> if you're a notary who is an attorney, obviously you can practice law, right? But if you're a notary and you're not an attorney, you cannot draft legal records or give legal advice or otherwise practice law. The notarial certificates and notarial acts. So we talked about uh, different types of things that we're going to do here, and uh, now we're going to get into that. So notarial certificates prior to October first, if there was not a notarial certificate on a document that you were being accident prior to October first of twenty twenty, I should say, uh, if there was not a certificate on a document, you did not add one. Now, effective October first, twenty twenty. The law requires that a certificate uh, is completed for each and every notarial act. Each and every notarial act requires a notarial certificate. If a certificate is not included on the record being notarized, the notarial officer will be required to affix that certificate in the manner addressed. Uh, you know, as we go throughout this presentation, a different type of notarial certificate is required for each type of notarial act. There's examples in the handbook. Uh, in part eight of uh, various notarial certificates, uh, where each notarial certificate or notarial act and each each act and the certificate for each act is addressed, and uh, the person signing the document is really dictating what certificate is going to be attached uh, based on the request they give. So notarial certificates, if anybody's wondering what that means, 
we're talking about uh, the the wording that says state of Maryland County of blank. Uh, sometimes they say sworn and subscribed before me. Sometimes they say acknowledged before me. Sometimes they just say witness or attested to a signature. Those are the notarial certificates uh, that we're talking about. And Mike, just to be clear, anybody who would like to um, use the template that's in uh, the handbook that says an example, they can do that. You can drop and you can use those templates. It's certainly fine for you. You don't have to use it, but they're available if you would like to use them. Great, great point, great point. Uh, if you're not sure or you're uh, wondering, no need to reinvent the wheel, they're in the handbook, you can use them. Uh, each, that's what they're there for, right? That's exactly what they're there for, to help you out and help you if you need to use them. So each notarial act shall be evidenced by a certificate, that certificate shall, and this is key here, be executed contemporaneously with the performance of the notarial act. So if we're in person, we're doing this at the same exact time and setting as when the person signed the document. I need a notarial act. I go to the notary. I'm in person. They identify me. They watch me sign the document. And depending on the type of notarial act, maybe it's an acknowledgement or oath or affirmation, they administer that. At that time, they're completing that certificate as soon as all that happens. So this is occurring in the same setting and time. Uh, the only real exception to this is uh, remote notarial acts uh, for tangible records where I'm recording it and you're sending it to me and I'm, I'm comparing it to the video when I receive that tangible record. Uh, be signed and dated by the notary public. The signature should be signed in the same manner as on file with the clerk of the circuit court uh, for the county in which the notary public was commissioned. So when you go to the clerk of the court and you take your oath of office and receive your commission, you're signing the book there. Sign the book the way you sign. Uh, that way, uh, your signature is, is comparable to what is on file there. Identify the jurisdiction in which the notarial act is performed. So uh, I mentioned earlier, state of Maryland, county of. When you're filling out that certificate, the line for state should always say Maryland, right? You are always in Maryland when you are notarized. And we, we talked about that a few slides ago. The Maryland notary must be in Maryland when they notarize. So that certificate should always say state of Maryland, because if you are located elsewhere, you're not using that Maryland notary seal. Uh, so if you're using your Maryland notary seal, certificate always says state of Maryland, but then county of, it's usually county of, and there's a blank space. And in that field, you're gonna write the county in which you are performing the notarial act, not the county where you're commissioned. They may not always be the same, so I, I gave an example earlier where I commissioned in Baltimore City. And if I'm out in Ocean City and somebody needs me to notarize something and I have my notary stuff with me, uh, that notar notarial certificate is going to say state of Maryland, county of Worcester, because you're in Worcester County, Maryland, um, even though my notary seal will say Baltimore City. So the certificate is being completed for what is happening at that moment in time. Where am I? I'm in the state of Maryland. What county am I in when I'm notarizing? And then you fill in the blanks on the notarial certificates based on, again, you know, what's the date? Who's appearing before me? What am I doing? What am I being asked to do as a notary? Uh, so the notarial well, I can make a really good point. You said you had you used in that example of being in Ocean City, you had your notary stuff with you. You would also document that entire transaction in your journal at that very same time. So all of those steps are being occurring contemporaneously at the very same time in which you're performing the notarization. Right. And uh, the notarial certificate is also going to contain the title of office of the notarial officer. Uh, so in, in the case of a notary public, it's going to say notary public. Uh, if the notarial officer is a notary public, indicate the date of expiration, if any, of the notarial officer's commission. So if you're a notary public, you have an expiration date. That expiration date should be on that certificate. Uh, People will see the term notarial officer and notary public. A notarial officer, there's a there's a group of individuals that are allowed to notarize uh, documentation under the law. Um, certain judicial officials uh, can also notarize things. And a notary public is just one type of notary notarial officer. Uh, but for the overwhelming majority of folks, you become a notary public. 
in order to notarize. So if you're wondering what the difference in terms are, there's, there are certain people that just by their uh, profession, uh, clerk of the court, deputy clerk, uh, certain judges that can notarize without having to become a notary public. So uh, notarial certificates, a little more on certificates, a notary public may not affix their signature to or logically associated with the certificate until the notarial act has been performed. So you've identified them, you've watched them sign the document. If there's an oath or an affirmation or acknowledgement, you've administered it. At that point in time, now you can complete that notarial certificate. The notary public uh, shall also affix their official stamp or, or embalser to uh, the certificate. The certificate should be part of or securely attached to the record. Part of or securely attached to, people ask us what that means all the time. Uh, there are many ways to make it a part of or securely attach it to the record. If, uh, if your method involves attaching it or making it a part of the tangible record or the electronic record, uh, then, you know, as long as it's part of or securely attached to. If a notarial act regarding an electronic record is performed, the notary may attach an official stamp to or logically associate that stamp with the certificate. The certificate should be affixed to or logically associated with that electronic record. So different types of notarial acts, we've covered certificates, no matter what type of, uh, so, so these notarial acts you have, you're going to have that certificate. Uh, the first type of notarial act and one of the main ones that you will see and perform is uh, an acknowledgement. So an acknowledgement is a declaration by an individual. Before a notarial officer, the individual has signed the record for the purpose stated therein. And if the record is signed in a representative capacity, the individual uh, that signs that record is acknowledging that they have proper authority and signed it as the act of the individual or entity identified in the record. So you have acknowledgments in an individual capacity and in a representative capacity. Uh, an example may be somebody that is, you know, a president of a company or something like that. And they're they're signing something on behalf of the company in a representative capacity because of the company's president. That's that's what representative capacity is referring to. Um, so an acknowledgment Again, it's not a statement of truth, right? They're not swearing to the truth of something. They're acknowledging uh, that they're signing the record for the purpose stated therein. How does a notary public take an acknowledgement? So here's a step-by-step -step for completing an acknowledgement. And you remember earlier, I, we listed out five things. You're going to start seeing those five things an awful lot here uh, throughout the rest of this presentation. The person making the acknowledgement must personally appear before the notarial officer, whether that's in person or using communication technology. A notarial officer must properly identify the person requesting the notarial act. So we're identifying them through one of the methods allowed under the law. Uh, best way again is identification credential, driver's license, passport, some type of government issued photo ID. The notarial officer must properly identify them. They must record the details in the notarial act and the notary's journal. Uh, Assistant Secretary Smith mentioned uh, not that long ago when we were talking about the example of notarizing something down in Ocean City um, that you need to record it in your journal. You have to record every act in your journal. Every single notarial act has to be recorded in your journal. And uh, you should do that here. Some somebody say, well, why would I record it, you know, after I've gone through the identification process? Well. Uh, you want to get that signer's information in your book. You want to make sure that it's there. Um, but also every now and then something may occur as uh, the notarial act plays out that may make you say, you know what, I can't notarize this. And you may have to deny a notarial act for one reason or another. And if you have the information in your journal, you already have uh, that information written down uh, so that if, if a denial does occur, you know who it happened for and you can make a note as to why it happened. Uh, on the off chance that that comes back up as to why you were denied the notarial act. <clears throat> if a note, uh, if not already signed by the person executing the record, observe the signing of the document. So in an acknowledgement, uh, generally they're going to come to you and they're going to take the acknowledgement and they're going to sign that document. Uh, it is possible that they may have already signed uh, the document 
And when they come to you, they're just taking the acknowledgement and acknowledging that they signed that document. So after they sign it, or if they've already signed it, you're going to take the spoken statement of the individual executing the record. The person must, uh, making the acknowledgement, must state to the notary that the document constitutes uh, their act and deed. And um, so if this individual has already signed it, they're just going to acknowledge that it constitutes their act and deed and, and you know, that, that they signed it. Uh, so you're not going to need to make them re-sign it if it's an acknowledgement. Complete well, sign. Just to, at the point of clarification, I appreciate that you're talking about acknowledgement, but to ensure that folks uh, do not become confused, this is different than witnessing a signature in which you actually have to witness the signature the document has to be signed physically in front of you. You may just want to withdraw that briefly. Yep, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about acknowledgments. That we're gonna get oaths and affirmations, and that we're gonna talk about witnessing or attesting to a signature. So that's gonna it's a different type of notarial act. We're gonna cover it very shortly uh, up ahead. So acknowledgments, uh, complete and sign the notarial certificate on the record, including the expiration date of the notary's commission if it's not on the stamping device. A, a sample acknowledgment. Certificates can be found in the notary handbook. Again, we mentioned earlier, those, those certificates are in the handbook. Use them. Um, uh, if, if you're not sure what to attach, use what's in the handbook uh, if an acknowledgement is required. Many times, acknowledgements are going to already be on the documentation that they're asking you to notarize. Uh, so you see acknowledgements, it's a pretty common form of notarial certificate. Uh, and then uh, the notary, after completing the certificate, is going to apply their stamping device, um, you know, with that certificate and record. So acknowledgments, again, not a uh, not a statement of truth. It's it's acknowledging that that the record constitutes the individual's act and deed, and they're signing and they are acknowledging that. Uh, if the individual doesn't expressly say that themselves, you can ask the individual if it constitutes their act and deed, and they would just need to say yes in that scenario. Verification on oath or affirmation. So it's a declaration made by an individual on oath or affirmation before a notarial officer that a statement in a record is true uh, or that a remotely located individual has the identity claimed. We talked about earlier um, identifying through a credible witness. So when you see that wording about a remotely located individual has the identity claimed, we're talking about a credible witness swearing to the, to the fact that the individual has their identity. But otherwise, we're talking about uh, declarations made by somebody before a notarial officer that something in that record is true. So oath and affirmation, uh, that's when you're swearing to the truth of something in a record. How does a notary public take a verification on oath or affirmation? So again, step by step, you're going to notice those five things in here again. Um, and we're going to go through them again. It's important to drive the point home uh, every time. Uh, so you always have to personally appear before the notarial officer, whether that's in person or communication technology that's making that in-person appearance happen, need to appear before the notary. The notary must properly identify the person requesting the notarial act each and every time. The notary needs to record the details of the notarial act in their journal each and every time. And the notary must observe the signing of the document. So on the oath of affirmation, you must observe the person sign the document. Uh, take the individual spoken statement that the individual swears or affirms that the contents of the document are true, either on their personal knowledge or to the best of their knowledge, information, and belief. So you could ask the signer, uh, you know, if it's just if the statement says that the notarial certificate is an oath or affirmation and it simply says sworn and subscribed before me. You know, a, a, a simple, do you swear the contents of the document are true? Signer says yes, or the signer themselves states that they swear the contents of the document are true. Uh, if, if it's something that requires you to add the phrasing on personal knowledge or to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, the notarial certificate will have that wording in there. If you look at the sample certificate in the handbook, it's just a sworn and subscribed before me. And what does that mean? That means the person is swearing or affirming uh, and subscribing, i.e. signing before the notary public, which is why the notary in this case must observe the signing of the document. The certificate is saying you did. It's saying that they swore to and subscribe that before you, the notary public. 
so the notary, when that's all done, is going to complete and sign the notarial certificate on the record. And again, sample certificates in the notary handbook. The notary is going to apply that stamping device to the notarial certificate uh, associated with or attached to or affixed on that record. So another type of notarial act, you have acknowledgments, you have oath and affirmations, very common uh, situations. Much of the same, but some slight uh, but important differences there in the middle uh, for acknowledgments and oaths and affirmations. Moving on to witnessing or attesting to a signature. Um, so a notarial officer who witnesses or attests to a signature uh, shall determine from personal knowledge or satisfactory evidence that the individual appearing before them and signing the record has the identity that they claim. Um, so if somebody's just saying, hey, I need you to notarize my signature, this is it, right? This is that certificate. If it's not already attached to that document, um, and you're just being asked to notarize one signature. It's the witness or attesting to a signature certificate. And this notarial act uh, really replaces what used to be known as notary as official witness. So if you remember, we talked about prior to October 1st of 2020, not everything required a certificate. And if there wasn't, there was a process you would follow to just witness their signature as a notary. This is essentially the replacement for that. Um, now there's a certificate that is required when you're witnessing someone's signature or someone is saying that you know they're they're attesting to the fact that it was signed by them this is it so what are we doing when we witness or attest to a signature as a notary public again we're going to we're going to go through these step by step you've heard this one before personal appearance right in person or communication technology personal appearance second one identify the person requesting the notarial act Third, record the details of the notarial act in the notary's journal. All of these things, each and every time, personal appearance, identification, recording the notarial act in the notary's journal. So if, uh, if, if the document is not already signed by the person executing the record that's appearing before you, you observe the signing of the document. If the document's already signed by the person executing the record, the individual will test to the fact that the individual did sign that record. Uh, you'll notice there's a sample certificate in the notary handbook uh, where it usually says witnessed before me. If you did not witness them signing the document, the, the word uh, in parentheses there is or attested or attest, you would use the word attest rather than witness, right? If you didn't watch them sign it, you can't say you witnessed it. You would say that, that they attested to the fact that they signed it. Uh, but generally, they're going to come to you, they're going to sign the record, and, and your certificate is going to say witness before me. And uh, so you're going to uh, complete and sign that notarial certificate. And uh, if, if it's not already there, you're going to attach it. And again, sample certificate in the notary handbook. Uh, why reinvent the wheel? It's there. It's there to be used as an example. And the wording for these sample certificates comes right out of the laws. We talked about the law lookup way back at the beginning of this town hall. And uh, those sample certificates down in our handbook, uh, those are pulled directly from the wording in the law. Apply the notary stamping device to the notarial certificate uh, that's on or affixed to or logically associated with that record. So witnessing or attesting a signature this is the other big type of notarial act that you see frequently. And uh, somebody just wants their signature witnessed. This is what you're doing. So certify or testing a copy of a record. A notarial officer, uh, they can certify or test a copy of a record or an item that was copied. And, and they shall determine that the copy is full, true, and accurate transcription reproduction of the record or item. Uh, now, what's important to understand here is the notary is, is certifying a copy of a record in someone's possession. So if I bring a record to a notary, they're certifying that what they're notarizing is a true copy of a record in my possession. If you look at the certificate wording in the handbook, uh, it'll, it'll show much more clearly uh, as to uh, you know as to exactly what you're doing, but it's a key phrase in the certificate. And why do I make this distinction? Um, you know, if I have something, uh, 
I'm asking you to certify it as a true copy. Maybe it's a document from a business or a document from a, I don't know, a school or university or something. The notary doesn't really know if that's a true copy of whatever that is. Uh, they know that it's a true copy of the original that's in the individual's possession. So I would take the original record and a copy of it, or I would take the original record and the notary would make a copy of it. And the notary would compare the two and make sure that it's it's truly a, a copy of the record that's in my possession. Um, so they're certifying it's a copy of a record in the individual possession, but going through these steps again, um, personal appearance, right? Whether in person or on communication technology, each and every time must personally appear before the notarial officer. Identify the person requesting the notarial act each and every time. Record the details of that notary's journal each and every time. If the copy of the record was not already created by the person requesting the act, observe the copying of that record. If the record was already copied, look at the original, look at the copy, uh, make sure it's a full, true, and accurate reproduction of the original record. Then go complete and sign the notarial certificate on record. Uh, on the record, uh, if no notarial certificate is already present, you'll use the one from the handbook as an example. Like I said, it's in the handbook. They're pulled right from the law. Um, use that sample certificate to attach to the copy that's being certified. And again, you'll see in the certificate, it talks about a certified copy in someone's possession or you know record in someone's possession. Uh, so it would be in the, in the individual who's requesting the notarial act in their possession. Apply the notary stamping device to the notarial certificate uh, on a fixed or logically associated with that record. Certify a tangible copy of an electronic record. So this is for when there is an electronic record. Uh, you'll probably see this in the remote notary world a lot uh, where something is remotely notarized and there's an electronic record and you now need to make a tangible record of that electronic transaction to take and give to somebody or file somewhere if they don't take electronic filings. So a notarial officer uh, can certify a tangible copy of an electronic record is an accurate copy. Uh, and what they're doing is reasonably determining the electronic record is in a tamper evident format and personally prints or supervises the printing of the electronic record onto paper or other tangible medium. Uh, what you'll often you know, have in, in the remote online notary vendor uh, area is you'll have all those records that have been notarized uh, and all those transactions are stored on that platform. And then you could go back and print that record that was an electronic record on that platform and attach a certificate, which we're going to cover in the next step there, that, that is certifying it's a tangible copy of an electronic record. So you're only really seeing this from things that were remotely or electronically notarized. A, uh, how, does, how does one certify a tangible copy of electronic record? So again, personal appearance, right? Somebody has to come before you uh, in order to notarize in person or through communication technology. Uh, in, this, in this instance, it's gonna be in person, right? Because um, giving them a tangible record of something that was done for them. The notar notary officer must properly identify the person requesting the notarial act, uh, must record the details of the notarial act in a journal, right? Each and every time, identify act recorded in the journal. The notary, uh, notarial officer must reasonably determine whether the electronic records in a temper evident format. If the electronic record uh, was created using a remote online notary vendor, other uh, technology uh, does that. And uh, the notarial officer must personally print or supervise the printing or, of the electronic record on the paper or other tangible medium. Notary is going to complete and sign that notarial certificate on the tangible record. And if no certificate is present on that tangible record, affix the correct notarial certificate. An example, again, found in the handbook. Certificates in the handbook pulled straight from the law. Apply the stamping device to the certificate. Uh, affix or logically associated with that record. So we're having uh, an electronic record become a tangible copy. Um, so that electronic record stayed electronic through the notarial act. And now we're, somebody's going to reproduce it on a, on a tangible medium or paper medium. 
and they may need to authenticate or have it certified that that is a, a true copy of that electro tangible record of that electronic record. This is how you do that. Last uh, uh, thing on the list of uh, types of internal acts, protest of a negotiable instrument. It is unlawful for any notary public to sign and issue any protest except in a form prescribed by the comptroller. Uh, that's in uh, section 18.106 of the state government article. Um, an material officer who makes or notes a protest of a negotiable instrument shall make or note the protest in accordance with uh, this section of the commercial law article, the annotated code. Uh, talks about uh, protesting uh, being a certificate of dishonor, uh, usually in some type of transaction uh, that was not fulfilled. The key take home on certificates it, uh, on, on the uh, on a protest is that a protest is not required except upon dishonor of a draft, uh, which is drawn or payable outside of the United States and its territories and the District of Columbia. So a protest is only ever required in a scenario where something is going to or coming from outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. Uh, it is not something to be used for transactions occurring within the United States. Uh, matters regarding dishonor negotiable instruments are found in commercial law. Um, if anybody's uh, looking at this going, huh, uh, this is a very, uh, I can't think of a time where it's been used in, in my years at the office. And um, it's not really a, a thing that's frequently done uh, anymore. And um, so you're probably not going to see a protest. Uh, you're mostly going to see when we talk about these types of material acts, you're going to see acknowledgments. You're going to see oaths and affirmations. And you're going to see official, you know, witnessing or attesting to a signature. Um, Notarial certificate is required for each, you know, and every notarial act that the notary public performs. Um, oath or affirmation is a declaration made by an individual uh, before the notarial officer that a statement in a record is true. Um, a notary can witness or attest to signature. Uh, they shall determine the identity of the individual appearing before them and signing the record. The acknowledgement. Uh, it's not an oath or affirmation. It is different, right? Oath or affirmation is a statement of truth. Acknowledgement is uh, that somebody signed a record for the purpose stated therein. A notary can certify a copy of a record that's in someone's possession or that a tangible record is a copy of an electronic record. Uh, one tip people say, well, what, you know, how do I know it's an oath or affir an affirmation? How do I know it's an acknowledgement? An acknowledgement in the certificate, it's going to say the word acknowledged, right? If it says acknowledged before me, it's an acknowledgement. Uh, the tip that it's an oath or affirmation is that it has the word sworn or affirmed. Uh, sworn for oath, affirmed for affirmation. Uh, it has that wording in the certificate. And that's how you know it's an oath or affirmation. So acknowledgement usually has the word acknowledged, right? Easy to detect that. Uh, sworn or affirmed is included in a certificate for an oath or affirmation. And for witness, you know, it's going to say witnessed, right, or attested, uh, depending on the situation, but normally witnessed in that certificate. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope if nothing else, too, I, I think we, we went through every step and we made sure I did step by step each time with the notarial acts. Always personal appearance, whether in person or remote. Always identifying. The individual requesting the notarial act. Always keeping a journal, always completing the certificate, always affixing the notary's stamping device that are otherwise known as their seals each and every time. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and thank you to all of you who joined us today. We are at 11 o'clock. So this is the, the official end of our town hall. But as I shared earlier and as indicated in the email notification about today's town hall, the town hall was recorded. A link to the recording will be available on the Secretary of State's website. And by choosing to participate in today's town hall, you can send it to the recording as a part of this. As I stated earlier, the content and presentation provided is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be legal advice. I hope this town hall was helpful and informative. 
Uh, we will conduct additional town halls during 2022. In September, we're having one on how to avoid complaints, the top 10 mistakes, and in November, one on remote notarizations. Feel free to drop a topic in the chat box if you have suggestions about topics for future town halls, if they are within the scope of our authority.